Good afternoon. I'm really pleased to uh, welcome you. Uh, I'm Adi Ophir, a visit, visiting professor at the Institute for the Humanities, the Kogut Institute for the Humanities and the Middle East Study Program. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to host here today Rivesvek, my dear friend and uh, a colleague. Uh, Dr. Zweig is one of the leading Palestinian intellectuals and engaged intellectual working today in Israel-Palestine. Uh, he was one of the founders uh, of Balad. <laughs> one of the founders of Balad. Uh, the Palestinian National Party called the National Democratic Assembly. Uh, and uh, he has practiced law, politics, uh, and political activism in a variety of forms, uh, always under the assumption, I would dare to say, uh, that writing and law and politics are forms of war conducted by other, hopefully better means. Raif is a legal professor and a legal and political theorist, interested in a legal philosopher, excuse me, and a political theorist, interested in questions of citizenship and identity and legal interpretation. He earned his law degrees at the Hebrew University, at Columbia University, and at Harvard University. Uh, today, he is an associate professor at the Ono Academic College, where he teaches jurisprudence property law and law and culture. Uh, among his recent publications, there are, there are, there's an essay on Ronald Working and Duncan Kennedy, two views of, on interpretation, an essay on subject, subjectivity and subjection, subjugation, another essay on Kant, time and revolution, another essay on the political theology of the uh, Islamic Jihad, uh, and uh, an essay that relates more quickly to, to the topic of his talk today, uh, published in 2016, uh, When Does the Settler Become Native? And another one, again, on the same, in the same area and the same topic, uh, Israel, Palestine, now and South Africa, then on the an analogy and its limits. Uh, over the last decade, Raif has been the academic co-director of the Minerva Center for the Humanities at Tel Aviv University and a senior, senior researcher at Van Leer Institute in Jerusalem. At the Minerva Center, he, is di he directs research programs uh, that focus on the multiple spheres of interactions between Jews and Palestinians in Palestine, Israel. More, most recently, looking beyond Israel-Palestine, he is engaged in a program of research on the humanities in conflict zones, asking uh, <coughs> how uh, the humanities are or how they should be studied uh, in conflict zones. Today he will speak to us on Palestine as a question, paraphrasing or referring, of course, to uh, Edward Said's work uh, the question of Palestine. Wife, I welcome you. Yeah, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, first, uh, of course, I would like to thank uh, Adi, a colleague and an old friend. Um, we thought together, we acted together, we co-directed the Minerva Center for the Humanities uh, uh, together. Um, I would like to thank uh, the uh, Brown University, the Watson Institute for this invitation. And of course, I would like to uh, thank you for coming, for showing up in uh, the beginning of real spring and for preferring to be in the shadow where you could be in the sun. This is a precious thing uh, at this time of the year, and uh, it's a scare resource, the, the sun. So I really appreciate uh, 
your readiness uh, to be here. <coughs> um, I will talk probably about 30, 40 minutes. Given that the topics are plentiful and the events are really very intense and the processes in Palestine, Israel are really dense, fast, full of uh, meanings uh, and pregnant with dangers and possibilities, uh, probably um, different people around here in the audience uh, are interested in different things. So probably my opening remarks would allow uh, further discussion. Um, so what I promise is that my answers will be uh, uh, elaborate, long, and I would, uh, will use them as an invitation to continue my lecture. Uh, so uh, because that way I, uh, you can, it would be a talk on demand in a way that you can press the button and ask the question and this way you can, I can continue uh, uh, the lecture on the path that you, you would like it to. I mean, we, we are, <coughs> after an election, we are having a new government that uh, probably in a couple of weeks we will have a new government, new old government. It's quite a question if there's something new in this election. I think this is a very interesting question. We're probably less than a year after the passing of the new basic law of uh, Israel as a, um, the basic law nation state law uh, in Israel. And uh, it's becoming more and more clear actually that this law has more to do with uh, the West Bank than it has to do only with Israel, in a way that the questions of uh, the legal system in Israel is becoming also the question of the future of Palestine as a whole. And this is probably something that I will end my talk by referring to. Um, uh, the, the entanglement of the internal politics of Israel, of its definition as a Jewish and democratic, and the future of the West Bank and of the Palestinian questions, how these are becoming entangled like never before. And the question of internal politics and regional politics becoming intertwined in a way that we cannot think one separately from the other. So that's something that I will end my talk there. And um, I invite you for questions uh, on, on, that, on that regard. Now, the question of Palestine, or Palestine as a question, probably is unthinkable without thinking about Israel or Zionism. It's becoming more and more difficult to think about Zionism without thinking about Palestine or thinking about the different faces and faces with C and with PH. Phases and faces of the question of Palestine uh, without thinking about Zionism. And it's probably also thinking about Zionism without thinking the reaction of the Palestinian to the Zionist movement. It's difficult to think how Zionism would have crystallized without the uh, Palestinian uprising in 1929 or 1936 or the events of 1948 or the first intifada. So the idea, and since we are in a university, to think that we can teach Middle Eastern history separately completely from Jewish studies, or the history of Israel as completely separate from teaching the history of the Middle East, is just erects a false 
and uh, boundary, epistemic boundaries, that I think we should learn how to overcome those epistemic boundaries because things are far more related and there are mutual influences far more than we think. So the first thing that I wanted to say about Palestine as a question and the question of Palestine is actually to go back to Said, to Edward Said, who at one point thought about, first of all, he coined the term, the question of Palestine. Um, in his lectures on the intellectual, he thought that one of the roles of the intellectuals is actually whenever there is injustice or disposition or suffering, is to try to universalize that injustice in a way that it can connect it to other places, other people, other eras, and other areas of injustice. So for me, the question of Palestine is pretty much a continuation of the Jewish question. In the Jewish question that basically was a European question, that was basically a question of the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe. So the, the, the problem was created in Europe, but Europe thought, and so the Zionists thought, that it could be relocated in Palestine as an answer. So if the Jewish question is a European question, Zionism thought that the answer is outside Europe. So it's a way to leave Europe in order to join Europe by creating a nation state outside Europe. Um, but by ending the problem of the Jewish refugees, by ending the problem that faced Jews in Europe that was obsessed with purity, with ethnic and religious purity, um, the solving of that problem created the problem of the Palestinian refugees. So in any way you look at it, the Jewish question and the Palestinian question, the Jewish question of yesterday is entangled into the Palestinian question. And Europe is entangled in the Palestinian question in this sense. So one thing is that probably we should read these two questions in their mutual relationship. So the Palestinian question is not only happening in the Middle East, it's a European question, it's a conceptual question of the continuation of the project of enlightenment, actually, and its crisis. So it's still going on as a European question, as the Jewish question in Europe, in fact, was not only a Jewish question out of the blue. It was the question of actually, of as Hannah Arendt taught us, it was the question of, I'm speaking mainly about the Holocaust, uh, not only anti-Semitism writ large, is that the way that the West theorize, conceptualize the other through the construction of race with the uh, obsession with the ideas of purity of race that didn't start in Europe. It started in this country vis-a-vis -vis the Indians. The one drop theories are not an invention of the racist European countries. It's an invention of this country. Now, this invention traveled back to Europe. What is unique about anti-Semitism and the Holocaust in Europe, there are many things that are unique. The numbers are, of course, unique. The system is, of course, unique. The machine is, of course, unique. The bureaucracy is, of course, unique. All of that is unique. But the idea that you exterminate others because of their race, is the transfer of ideas and machines that were already established in the colony to Europe. And Europe was surprised all of a sudden 
that the machine that we use other places is just being put back on European territory. I'm just saying that because we probably, while we should see the distinctiveness, the particularity of each question and the pain of each people, and I don't think that victims should ever compete over their victimhood. There is enough victimhood for everybody, and there is enough suffering for all of humanity. But it's still, it's important to see the connections and not to indulge into a um, certain mode of uniqueness that doesn't allow us uh, uh, to see that there are historical uh, processes that allows us to see connections. So this is the first thing that I wanted to say about the Palestinian question, and that it is still a question that puts a challenge on the project of human rights, of enlightenment, of liberalism, of cosmopolitanism that Europe have preached for the last uh, two centuries. So, so this is the first thing I want to say about the concept of a question. The second thing is that I still think that we ought to speak about the question of Palestine in the singular. Why is that? Because there is a tendency, as a matter of brute facts, as a matter of reality, as a matter of geographic fragmentation, that we might be tempted to think of the problem of Gaza, the problem of the Palestinian refugees, the problem of the West Bank, the problem of East Jerusalem, because East Jerusalem had a special status. They are resident, they are not full citizen, it's very... And the problem of the Palestinian citizen of Israel. I am a Palestinian citizen of Israel. There is a tendency to speak about this problem separately. And I want to argue that despite the fact that these are different manifestations that bear a unique ways of probably creating unique problems, and they demand probably different answers, it's impossible to conceive of them, to understand them, without understanding the way of their becoming. And to understand, and to understand a thing, actually, is to tell the story of its becoming. That is historically understanding. To understand these problems, one must understand the Palestinian question basically as one question that erupted in 1948. So these are the different parts, the shattered parts of the Big Bang of 1948 and its aftermath. But definitely, there is one big question of a people that used to live on its land and in 1948 and aftermath, either it was subjugated to other rule or they were expelled. Some live under occupation, some live as second class citizen, and some are refugees. Now, why is that important? It's not important because the solution is actually to rewind history, that there's one solution to all problems. No, there's not one solution to all problems. There are different solutions, but to understand how it happens that we reach this point, we have to see this fact. Now, for me as a Palestinian in Israel, if I just want to argue for equality in Israel, if we take the frame of 1948, this is the year that Palestinians were majority and became minority, that they lost their national project. If I just want to argue regardless of the fact 
of 1948, of this big loss, then my arguments start to sound like if I was an immigrant that is asking for equality. The loss, I, I lose the sense of loss. It's important to keep the idea that we lost something in 1948. As a citizens, we lost something. We lost the city, Haifa. There is no nation without the city. Haifa, the capital of the north of 70, 80,000 Palestinians, only 3,000 remained. How can you imagine a community without the center, without the heart, which is the city? Not to speak about land confiscation, etc. But if you perceive this loss, then the demand of equality is a compromise on the part of the Palestinian in Israel. It is a compromise. Equality is a compromise. We're not immigrant. It's only if you can regain the frame of what has been lost, you can conceive of it as a compromise. The same goes with Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. Now, the West Bank and Gaza, both together, the full area of both, including all the settlements that are there, it's only about 22% of historic Palestine. If you conceive that, you can imagine why this is a huge compromise on the part of Palestinians to accept the Palestinian state on West Bank and Gaza. Why the Palestinians should accept to have 22% of Palestine. Now, you can put historical rights aside. Who came first? I mean, if somebody in the audience thinks that the land of Israel belongs to the people of Israel because before 2,000 years, God promised this land to the Israelis, to the Jews, there's nothing I can enter a debate historically with, with this kind of mode of argument. I mean, if, I mean what can I do if, if God has promised the land? I mean, who, who I am to say anything about that? But if we start to think, put aside historical rights, and when I say put aside, I mean to speak in, in the name of my people as a Palestinian nation. Let's put aside the fact that at, at 1920, there were 10% Jews in Palestine and 90% Palestinians. Clearly, most of the land owned by Palestinians. Even when Israel was created in 1948, 70% of the land belonged to the Jews. I mean, this, these are the facts by the Jewish records, by the Zionist records. Put all of that aside. Sorry? 70%, seven, sorry, sorry, sorry. 7% seven. Seven belong to, uh, uh, to the Jews. Put this historical fact aside. I'm, I'm not a big fan of historical rights, by the way. I mean, I grew up, I read too much Marx early on in my life, so I think people's need at many points should trump other people's sense of entitlement. Now, let's speak only about needs. Assuming that there are two people, the Jews and the Palestinians, it happens by now that actually, even in absolute numbers all over the world, they're about almost the same numbers. Why should the Palestinians accept 22%? Why not half of Palestine? Why not access to the sea? Assuming that the two people think of and believe that this is their homeland and they need the, that land and ready to die for that land. Let's put historical entitlement aside. Why not to split it actually in more fair manner? When you think about Palestine in this sense, when you regain the frame of 1948 and you see the loss, 
then you can start to understand why if the Palestinians would accept equality, it's a compromise. If they accept Palestinian state in the West Bank, it's a compromise. And if they agree for right of return only to that part of Palestine, which is a Palestinian state, not Israel proper, it's a huge compromise. Because if you don't start from that frame, then the frame is that we have disputed occupied land. The Palestinian claim it's occupied. Israeli thinks that there is no occupation because there was no sovereign before 1948. So it's a disputed. So let it split it at the middle. And the Palestinian seems are too radical because they insist to have all of the occupied territories, which means all of the 22% of historic Palestine. And now Israel is ready to negotiate. Actually, we're reaching the two-state solution. It's two-state solution. It's the West, in the West Bank, we will have two states. On half of the land, we will have Palestinian. On the other half, we have the settlement state. I mean, this is the kind of compromise we are, we are, we are moving ahead. So that's why I think there is an Im important role to speak about the Palestinian question before it has been fragmented to questions in the, in the, plural, in the plural. Now, all this being said, I want now to make three observations about the way I understand um, three phases in the way the question of Palestine thought, conceptualized, and the way Palestinian demands have evolved over the years. And then I want to state three moments about the history of Zionism that reach the current point of this last election. Now, what is the relation between the two moves, the, th the first three moments and the second three moments? I will not elaborate. I will keep it a little bit uh, as a kind of uh, homology that you can use your own imagination in order to connect the dots and to see probably what I leave missing so that this talk can continue to as a conversation even after I finish it. So this is a kind of implanting uh, a mind in mind, a mind in mind. So I think the three uh, moments that I want to speak about, and I would uh, make them a little bit fast, and then I will elaborate on them uh, later, is that the Palestinian question started basically 50s and early 60s, uh, basically as refugee problem. Regardless of the question, if the partition plan was just or was not just, were the Palestinian entitled to reject it or they were not, regardless of that. Regardless of the question, whether the Palestinians in 1948 were expelled by force or were not. Regardless of the question, if there was planned Dalit to evacuate parts of Western Galilee, uh, Lida, Ramla, Yaffa, or not, regardless of this question. As a matter of fact, by the end of the war, 700,000 Palestinians were uprooted from their homes, and they became refugees. And Israel didn't allow them back. Now, this is a separate decision. Not to allow them back analytically is not entailed in the fact of their deportation. You can say in the moment of war, 
we deported them. But that doesn't entail by definition that you don't allow them back when the war is over. These are two different decisions. As a matter of fact, the war ended by 700,000 refugees, Palestinian refugees. The Palestinian question started as a question of refugees and even started as a question of people trying to get back to their homes to sneak to their homes, to infiltrate, that's the language, to infiltrate where? To infiltrate to their houses, their own houses. Now, nobody can deny that. Neither the left wing, nor the right wing, nobody. Actually, nobody in Israel denies that. And the Palestinian question at those days was, first of all, a question of refugees and displacement. And the issue was how to create to move from the image of the refugee to the image of a freedom fighter who wants to claim his house back. First of all, his house. The Palestinian imagination starts from home, from his home, from his private home, not from even his homeland. The homeland is an extension, is an extrapolation of his home. I mean, it's not Zionism. In Zionism, first you have the homeland, and when you get to the homeland, you try to locate yourself on the map and create a home. The immediate loss of the Palestinian is the loss of the particular home with the tree and the horse and will of waters. And the question, how to organize those refugees to become political subjects, and they became political subjects through the PLO in the late 50s and in the 60s. That was the beginning of it. Nobody even sp spoke about other things. So that was the beginning. It returned and liberation. I mean, they thought, they didn't understand that the world had changed dramatically from 1940s to 1950s and 60s. It's just a new, completely different world that there is no one in the international community would dare to risk the existence of a Jewish state. But that was the first phase. The second phase, uh, which came l much later on, uh, is the territorialization of the Palestinian question. By mean territorialization, I mean uh, moving to the discourse of national self-determination and Palestinian statehood. This turn became after 1967, after the occupation of the rest of Palestine. And it became, gained more and more momentum during the 70s and the de-Arabization of the Palestinian question. If the Palestinian question at one point was the question of the Arabs, of the Arab states, by 1974, even before Sadat, but clearly with Sadat, actually the paradox of history that the defeat of 1967 brought the, the, the 1973, the October War, and the October War that gave some feeling of uh, self-respect to the Arabs brought the Camp David. So the defeat led to war, and the war led actually to a compromise with Israel. But those years were the years of the beginning of the territorial situation say a solution in the form of national self-determination. It started in 1974, de facto, uh, de facto, yes, where the Arab countries accept and declare that the PLO is the sole representative of the Palestinian, which means two things. On the one hand, it gave a standing for the Palestinian, but on the other hand, the Arab world said to the Palestinians, from now on, this is your struggle. And this, of course, with the 
Camp David and the visit of Sadat to Israel and the signing of the peace treaty in 1979 uh, brought this into completion. The de-Arabization uh, of the, uh, when, when Egypt is out, the whole, the, everything change. Uh, after that, uh, Iraq is completely destroyed. Um, and probably the de-Arabization in the Arab Spring reached its peak, where every Arab country now is busy with its, with its internal uh, regime. Now, the, this territorialization reached its peak in the first intifada in the late 80s. After the defeat of the PLO in Lebanon in the early 80s, the focal point of Palestine as a question moved to the West Bank, move on the territory itself. So that was, in my understanding, the first move where the struggle was with Israel to struggle within Israel at large, if we uh, understand Israel as from the river to the sea. So that was shifting the, the struggle from struggle over the borders to struggle within the borders. The first intifada was at the same time the move of the focal of the struggle from outside to the Israeli borders, challenging them to challenging the occupation in the West Bank. And that actually also symbolized a move from um, a revolution for liberation to thinking of ending the occupation and establishing statehood. Now, at that point, Palestinian state uh, could be thought as a sort of a compromise that um, can solve in many ways, um, and many thought that way. Uh, that probably, and uh, at least the Israeli left thought that way, it could solve the uh, problem of the refugees and the problem of the Palestinian in Israel. So the refugees would get to get back to the West Bank and the Palestinian Israel would be granted uh, equal citizenship I mean, as a fantasy, in both cases as a fantasy. Now, I think that the peace pr process long ago, I mean, is dead. Uh, probably we didn't uh, march in a funeral, or probably we didn't bury our dead uh, until now. So the mourning uh, haven't started yet. But as a matter of fact, I mean, at least, if not to say in 2000, in 2008, uh, when Olmert uh, lost the election to Netanyahu, it's clearly from since 2009, we are moving from any talk about peace process to a conversation about managing the conflict, uh, not solving the conflict. And I think from 2015, and probably even more 2016, with the election of Trump, we are moving from managing the conflict into eliminating the conflict. By what I mean by eliminating the conflict is that East journalism is out of the table. You, the UNRWA is dissolved, so there is no refugee problem. And now we are talking about annexing the West Bank or parts of chunks of the West Bank. So then what is left for the Palestinian to negotiate? De jure, not de facto. De facto, long ago, we, we've, we are witnessing the grabbing of land in the West Bank. Uh, now, this is serious, the talk about annexation. Now, if, if annexation, which is, as a matter of fact, taking place, as I said, anybody who goes to the West Bank will see the facts on the ground, but now we are talking de jure, that would mean that there is no more any territory where the Palestinian can stand when we, he wants to sign a peace treaty with Israel. There is no place left for the Palestinian as a nation to reach a historical compromise with Israel. 
Now, that doesn't mean that the problem would eliminate. I mean, that is a fantasy. Because the Palestinians are still there. But that would mean, probably, a deterritorization again of the problem. But this time, a deterritorization from another kind, which is it's a struggle over the rights of the Palestinian in Israel. And this time I see in Israel, that includes the West Bank. So that is a new phase, actually, in which Zionism, with its expansion, turns what used to be an external problem into an internal problem. So if, uh, if I were Hegelian, I would say this is uh, the transformation of the dialect of existence to the dialect of essence. But uh, I'm not Hegelian. Now, uh, let me tell the story, the same story, with the same sort of uh, curves uh, from a Zionist perspective. Not from Zionist point of view. It's just to tell the narrative um, as a progression of Zionism itself. I mean, Zionism from the start is not a cosmopolitan movement. It's a, a national settler movement from the start. It aims to solve the problems of the Jews, not the problems of humanity, clearly not the problems of the Palestinians. So by definition, it addresses one people and wants to solve the problem of one people. Uh, the National Jewish Fund is not a fund for, um, it's a fund that buys land to settle the Jews. All the association, all the organization in Palestine during the mandate, they were Jewish, purely Jewish. Uh, health, uh, transportation, insurance, uh, universities, schools, Everything was based on separation, on purity. So purity, separation was always there in Zionism as an organizing principle. The idea was to have a Jewish state. The problem is that Palestine is populated. What you would do with the problem of demography? Now, given that the, the Jewish leaders were committed to a democratic and liberal democratic, uh, sorry, and Jewish state. They solved the problem of demography by expulsion in 1948. Now, uh, be careful. If Israel wasn't committed to the idea of Jewish state, it could have incorporated the Palestinians, and it would be become democratic, but it's not Jewish. And if Israel was interested only in Jewish state and not democratic, they could have left the Palestinian and didn't grant them any rights. It's, it could have established apartheid from the first moment. But actually, it's commitment of its leader that thought that apartheid is actually a bad idea. So they expelled that out of mercy. They didn't think that it's a good idea to have an apartheid state. So they skipped or they escaped the apartheid regime. They solved the problem of demography by expulsion. The problem is that 1967 brought back the problem that was solved in 1948. And you're again facing the problem of a Palestinian couple of millions in the West Bank and Gaza. And again, you have to solve the problem of demography. The first solution was, or the first conceptual apparatus was that this is a benign occupation that wouldn't last forever. Now, the, the first intifada shattered this, this illusion. So the first solution after 67, if it was the benign occupation, was replaced with the idea of two states. The two states was a modus vivendi that solves lots of problems for Zionism because it keeps Israel as Jewish and democratic. And it keeps certain stability.
for the Jewish and democratic state. Now, the time passes, and actually, um, this peace process seems to be not leading anywhere, and the green line is not green anymore, and it's not a line anymore, and it's not a border. It's only border for the Palestinians. They can't cross it from east to west, but for Israeli settlers and Israeli government, they cross it all the time, and they build settlements, roads, university, railroads, everything. So the green line, again, uh, was eroded, and the settlement project as a continuation of Israel is accelerating. So Israel and the West Bank now looks as one geopolitical unit. So you're again faced with the demography. And you can't solve it anymore by territorial separation, that the Palestinians are there, the Israelis are here, because there are too many settlers that are there beyond the border. They are beyond the border, but inside the Israeli politics. So what is the solution? If, you, if there are two groups on the same territory under the same regime, Actually, they are not under the same regime, under the same sovereign, but actually different regimes of control. How, how can you solve this reality? You have three options. One, expulsion again. If we assume that genocide is not on the agenda, but I mean, so either you have an expulsion as a solution. The other, you have a binational democratic state. And the third option, that you make a new separation now, which is not territorial. It's not based between the green line, between Israel and the Palestinian territory. You make a new separation, which is based on ethno-religious lines. Regardless where the Jews are, and regardless where the Palestinians are, you simply enact two regimes of control, and it could be three regimes of control. When you do that, you can establish one regime of control for the Jews that are citizens of Israel, another regime of control for Palestinians, citizens of Israel, and a third regime, actually, for Palestinians in the West Bank. In all this history, separation was the guiding principle. But the principle has different manifestation in different moments in the history of Zionism. And if one want to learn a political lesson, and probably a philosophical lesson, is that politics is at the same time to see the commonality and the similarity, similarity and the underlying logic behind different phenomena, while at the same time recognizing that the same logic can produce different phenomena at different times with different practices. If there is a noble aim for politics, is exactly to be wise to see the similarities, but wise enough to see the differences, because where are there, where there is differences, where are there differences, where there is plurality of mechanism of action, the human will can interfere there and make a political move that actually can make some change in history. I'll stop here. Hello. Um, so I'm curious about um, where you place the responsibility of the other Arab countries um, that are not, you know, in Israel-Palestine. So when, once the refugees, once the Palestinian people became refugees, what do you believe is the responsibility of the places that took them in in refugee camps, such as Lebanon, Syria, 
uh, Jordan. You know, like, do you think that there would that the Palestinian problem would have reiterate would have been the same way if they simply integrated them into their economies and into their into their societies, as opposed to kind of you know, keeping them in refugee camps? Yeah, I mean, I I'm not in a position to defend any Arab country um, at all. I think it's a shame on Arab countries the way they, or at least some of them, treat the Palestinians. Uh, actually, some countries granted citizenship. In Jordan, they granted citizenship uh, for uh, Palestinians. In Lebanon, the situation is, is, is much worse. In Syria, it's, uh, it's, it's more complicated. But I wonder why uh, another country uh, should bear the, uh, the burden of uh, incorporating a whole people where their homeland is just half an hour drive from there. I mean, they didn't land from the moon. They have a home and a homeland, and probably the most natural thing um, is that they are entitled to go to their homeland. Now, the fact that there are duties on the Arab countries does not diminish in any way the responsibility of Israel. So clearly, there are more than one party that could be responsible for the well-being of the Palestinians. But the responsibility of Israel couldn't be diminished simply because there are other bad guys around. Uh, that's not a consolation. Thank you. Um, so what is your hope, or what is the end game for the oppressed Palestinian people? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, I mean, uh, the, the option, I can live with many solutions as a Palestinian. I can live with many solutions. I, I could have lived with the two-state solution. Um, and I can live with one-state solution. Um, as a matter of uh, projection, not as a wishful thinking now, or in part wishful thinking, the two-state solution, it's becoming more and more difficult. That doesn't mean that we are getting close to one-state solution. In many ways, the two-state solution is probably dead, and the one-state solution hasn't even born. So we are in the twilight of no solution in many ways. Uh, but if you allow me to speak in utopia, uh, I think this place is heading in historical perspective to to one state solution. Now, when I say one state solution, it shouldn't be that different from two state solution. L let me just say a couple of words about that. Palestine is, is a tiny place. It's a really tiny place. Any two state solution would require endless coordination between the two people. Water, sewage, uh, environment, currency, borders, I mean, you can't have really two-state solution as you have, let's say, whatever, Germany and France, probably. And even if you want to have one-state solution, given the fact that you have really two groups with different cultural, religious, emotional, and long, uh, tense, saturated history of victimhood and of identity, even if you grant the one-state solution, you should allow enough space for the different groups to celebrate this feeling of, of, of being alone, let's say, to, 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 to express their cultural uniqueness. So whatever is the solution, it must be a mix of being together and being apart. If the question, do I see that happening, I don't see it beyond the corner. Of course I don't. Do I see the two states happening? No, I don't see that is happening. I see more of the same for a long time. Uh, and that's probably the bad news, uh, that this conflict 
is just bleeding without a climax. It's, it's bleeding without a climax. Now, when I say I don't see, I don't see because I don't see a political will that is, I mean, if this country, the US, wants to impose a solution, it can do that just like that. I mean, I remember, I'm, I'm old enough to remember James Baker in one uh, Monday morning as a Secretary of State saying that when Prime Minister Shamir would be serious about peace process, he's the telephone number of the State Department. And, he, and alive, he just stated it. He said, zero, zero. The whole country was shaking in Israel. And they immediately went to Madrid conference. I mean, so l l part of the problem is here. It's here. And this is probably the beginning of my question. The issues are too related. The, Jew the Palestinian question and the Jewish question and the history of this country. So I don't know if that was hopeful or that was... Uh, actually, that's not so hopeful. Um, and I do agree with you that this country has a role to play and has some responsibility here too. Yeah. If but you... I, like, I like your view of let's look at people's needs and, and, you know, and trying to get some basic needs satisfied, whoever you are. Thank you. I mean, if, if you want to be more help, uh, hopeful, I was talking to Adi before we got here, is uh, there's always something happening while we are talking that we don't know what it is, in the sense that there are always undercurrents that you don't know unless they are come on the surface. So some of the hope comes from the fact that we are ignorant. Ignorance is the best blessing because it keeps the paths of history open. It's all right. Um, frequently we hear mostly from Israeli leaders, that there are no Palestinians with whom they can negotiate because of splits within the Palestinian leadership. Is there any value to turning the question around and asking whether there's any Israeli constituencies with whom the Palestinians can negotiate? And by that, I don't mean a catty remark about the Netanyahu government, but it, it, it seems to me that we've got multiple Israeli constituencies that have different visions of Israel. And they don't agree with each other. And in the structure of the Israeli government, they don't really have a format for working out those solutions among themselves. So I wonder if it's helpful to just turn the spotlight to the other side and whether this country can do some of that. Because clearly within this country, we have a big split within, and I think it's going to get bigger as people play on it. Um, but is there any value in your view to maybe just turning the microphone around to the Israeli side of the table and saying, okay, we've got post-Soviet folks, we've got ultra-Orthodox rabbis, we've got people who can't agree whether they're going to be in the Israeli Defense Force or not, whether they should all be part of one regiment or not. We've got all these different things within the Israeli community. Maybe there should be more talk about that. Uh, you, you mean that the Pal you're suggesting that the Palestinian address the different parts in the Israeli public spectrum that actually not necessarily agree with Netanyahu? So to open such a conversation, or did I? I don't think is, I don't think the Palestinians are in a position to do it. I was wondering whether it would be helpful. You had noted that this country has a role to play. Just wondering whether there's any value to having the different constituencies within this country open up a discussion which can then be flipped back. <coughs> but bluntly, if, if the Prime Minister of Israel can come and speak in front of the Congress of the United States, presumably it's not out of reach for the United States to return the favor and raise certain issues. I was just wondering whether there's any value to that or whether you think it would just lead to total chaos. 
I still am not sure that I got your question. If the question about what the Palestinian you suggest or what kind of policy this country or the public of this country can play vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli public. I'm sorry for... Yes, it's my fault. As an American, trying to figure out a way to be helpful to a situation. Is there any value as an American to asserting an American pressure for an American government to turn towards the Israeli government and put pressure to open up the discussion there and then the Palestinian, where I confused you, was would a Palestinian constituency object to that? Would that be viewed as unhelpful or would that be viewed as good luck with that but if you want to try it, go ahead? Yeah, I think the second option, first of all, <laughs> first of all, before speaking to the Israelis, I would suggest if you can speak to your government under this administration. I mean, what there is, the, there is not, but assuming that we are having another administration and the other administration, let's say Obama is back again, um, and he can speak to, um, I mean, anything the U.S. Uh, um, as I said. Uh, with a with sleight of hand, it can change things. If even they put just an um, outline, just an outline, without really putting pressure on Israel, that could encourage lots of debate within, within Israel itself. Part of the thing the Israeli left or peace camp or what remains out of the peace camp, part of its weakness that it lives in a international climate, America included, of course, that its position is not being supported internationally. And Netanyahu can say, why, why shall we negotiate with anybody? We, we're doing well. We're on the strong side. We're winning. The world, nobody, no Germany, no France, no America, nobody is pressuring us to do anything. Then why to change? So. To your suggestion, the Palestinian would tell you, whatever you think it can help, please go ahead. I mean, Abu Mazen have been almost begging anybody to do anything. Um, so the, 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 the Abu Mazen or, or the PA, I think would tell you, please go ahead, try your luck. Good luck if you can, if you can make any change, if you can interfere in any way uh, in the Israeli uh, public, which, which, uh, which I doubt it. How, how much alike the Jews and the Palestinians are in their quest for land. In both cases, I mean, I understand the Palestinians who some left on their own, fear, fearing the war, and, the, and some were obviously expelled. You know, Jews have lived in, in every world they lived in, they were expelled. And yet they were able to adapt to their diaspora. And in fact, my feeling <laughs> has been that it was good for the Jew to be in the diaspora because they had an opportunity to, expect, to excel. And history has shown us that, you know, there, the Palestinians had opportunities, they came here too, and I think they have excelled here. I have met many successful Palestinians. Mm -hmm. I don't think they want to go back to Palestine. I think they're, it, the majority of Jews in America, and even in Europe and South America, I don't know that they're yearning to go back. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's time to think of a different way of solving this problem, and not so much the land, but in the psychology of this. I mean, I think people have to come together and share their longings and their dreams and accept also the reality. The Jews are not going to leave Israel. I don't know that the Palestinians are going to get what they want back. I think they had opportunities to get a lot more back than they have now. I, what was it Abba Eben said about the lost opportunities of the Palestinians? They probably would have been 
happier today had they accepted something then than they, go, they are now looking at what little mm. they have. So how, how much longer are they going to be longing for a land that may never come into being? I mean, I, if you don't see a solution, then maybe the solution is a philosophical, you know, want, you know, but it's just not going to happen. And the other side to this, too, is Israelis mm -hmm. have left Israel. Hundreds of thousands have left Israel to come to the diaspora to live and to be successful. And I don't know that they will go back either. Mm -hmm. And it's leaving in its place a very religious, messianic population that is probably going to continue to grow in, in size. Mm. And you're not going to have very much luck with them, because like those Palestinians in the Intifada, they will, they will die on, mm. on Masada rather than you know, live without their land. So I, I don't know. I so mean, they've what, what do you suggest? I, <laughs> I say, you know, we've had many Israelis come here who are looking for peace. We've had Israelis and, and, and Palestinians mm. come, and they have a wonderful message of living together. And nothing happens because there, there's just, I don't, because either one dream is somebody else's nightmare. So maybe you have to, maybe the Palestinians have to forget getting all that land back that they want. How much and, they should get? You know, the, 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 I don't think the Native Americans are going to ever get back the United States. Do you? Sorry? The Native Americans, the, the, are they going to get back the United States? They live on reservations. They, they're hoping to make their life a little bit better under this terrible administration. But they, 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 they have to look at the reality that's on the ground and try and make a, a wonderful place, if they can, to live in the same way that I don't. The Palestinians have to think of ways to make the life of the people who are living in these situations better. My understanding is that Yasser Arafat took a lot of money that could have helped those people, and he took it and he stole it, or he gave it to his wife in France. I, I don't know. It was a bad history anyway. So, why aren't there people? looking at the real, <laughs> the real situation there and try to make it a much better place. And then hopefully, when you have an, a better economic situation, and maybe that is what is going to help. You know, the, the, the soda streams of the world have disappeared, but maybe we, we need more of that, more economic development, more of a Marshall Plan, I, I, you know. I'm, I know I'm <laughs> looking for answers, but the Marshall Plan worked. You know, why didn't we spend all that money that the Palestinians have gotten and all that aid that they got? And why don't you put it into building? What? Where? Bi business? Well, you, can, you there were, <laughs> in the past there was more land to build on. Now I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking at and saying this is all very philosophical and and the. The answers don't seem to be there. So another generation is going to grow up, and another generation, until finally people will forget. I don't know. I mean, I, I took your uh, suggestion is to forget. I mean. I don't forget uh, because there's no, I mean, uh, Jews, I mean don't, for, Jews so don't forget either. Yeah, I mean, to surrender, I'll forget, but I. I said I'm not obsessed with historical justice, but uh, I still I don't give up on the virtue of justice. But I think we sh we should aspire for more than people to forget. I think, and believe me, whenever there's a Palestinian state, I would be in exile. But I need Palestinian state in order to be exiled. First, it's a condition of my exile. I want to have the privilege to have a state and to wake one morning and to say to all of them, oh, I'm sick of your nationalism and leave. But I want this privilege. And there are many Palestinians who don't have interest to go back. I agree. There are 
five, six million Jews that don't have interest to go back, but they have the right to go back. Give me the right to go back, and then we can speak if I want to give it up. I probably would. But we as humans, we have duties to ourselves. If I take something from you, even if you don't need it, you have a duty to yourself to stand up for yourself because it's a duty to your integrity as a person. You can tell me, bring it back, you owe me. And after you have it back, you can contribute it to me. But it's not something that only supplies the need. The bayos, the, the bare life ask for bare needs. Humans ask also for respect. And part of respect is that when something is taken, we have a duty to ourselves to stand for ourselves and to ask for our rights. Rights are not something added to the self. It's something that constitutes the self. It what makes the human not only a biological phenomena, but as a but also as a political phenomena and a moral and a legal persona. No, I, I certainly can't I, argue I with that. I would like to ask uh, uh, students to contribute questions. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. You mentioned the transition between um, like the orientation of solving the conflict to managing the conflict, and then you talked about the transition between managing the conflict and sort of, you said ending the conflict in 2015 and 2016. Eliminating. Eliminating. Eliminating, sorry, that's what I meant. Um, and you mentioned the election of Donald Trump. Could you elaborate a little more on what you meant by eliminating the conflict? Yeah, I mean, I meant by eliminating the conflict is imposing a solution by force by one side. And I said that it's a fantasy of eliminating the conflict because you think that you're eliminating that if you don't give money to the UNRWA, then there's no refugee problem. That if you move the embassy, then Jerusalem is out of the negotiation. Or if Diorio and next the West Bank, then you decide the future of the West Bank. These attempts to dictate a solution, non-negotiated solution, that what I meant by eliminating the conflict. But the conflict, if it's eliminated or not, it's not a matter of logic. It's a matter of people on the ground fighting for their rights. spoke about a lot about right and respect. I would like you to speak about violence. Uh, you mentioned uh, the role of violence in the transition from uh, refugeeness to liberation. And this is the moment in which the Palestinians become political subjects, actually. Uh, and then the first intifada as a crucial moment in this, in this process, another violent <laughs> moment. And then second intifada as another crucial moment, turning point. Um, and c can you can you continue this and say, well, we are now in a in a situation in which apartheid, a Jewish apartheid, is de facto, of course, and almost the euro. Um, apartheid uh, is a is a condition that uh, deserves to be uh, resisted by all means. Can you, can you see a possible uh, a return to violence, uh, uh, yeah. a rational return to violence? I don't mean eruptions here and there of, of some, uh, you know, of some uh, uh, dissent, dissenting groups, but uh, uh, as, a, as a policy. Yeah. I mean, as a matter of projection, as a matter of reading the, uh, the factors in the ground, the political parties, the political powers uh, that are 
running the Palestinian, uh, the PA basically, I don't see, I don't see any strategy <laughs> at all. But also I don't see a strategy of, um, of violence in the, in the foreseen uh, future as a strategy. A part of that is the absolute imbalance of power between Israel and the Palestinian. This is, this is first. Second, uh, due to the fact that Israel have moved to a level of using violence that it lift up any restraints, not any, but almost any restraints on the using of violence. I mean, people forget that the people in Gaza are just demonstrating. You know, of course, they're throwing stones, etc. But they're not using fire against Israeli soldiers. And how many were killed? Hundreds. Nobody made fuss out of it in the free world. Not in this country, nor in Europe. So the use of, of pressure on Israel can yield results uh, if this pressure actually if there is Israel under certain constraint when it's using the violence back. So I think morally, people usually think that politically violence is okay, but morally it's not. I think the opposite. I think under situation of occupation, of course you're morally, you're entitled to use violence. What is settlements if it's not violence? I mean, the, uh, Israel is using not only manifest violence, but uh, uh, building the settlements where the threat of violence gets the results that you aim from violence. That is even worse than violence. But I think in the Israeli case, we reach really um, a point where violence cannot help and uh, the current situation cannot help. Uh, what I think it could be, the only thing could be helpful, is a new ways of struggle, actually. Mobilizing masses of hundreds of thousands doing small things. Hunger strike of 100,000 people. Uh, shutting the lights in all of Palestine, or, or, or something of that sort. But Israel knows no restraint over the use of violence against demonstrators. Imagine that there are violence in the street of, of, of Ramallah or, or any, any other place. Now, there was a time when violence in the West Bank, it could be thought as resistance of the occupation. And in many ways, the Israeli public opinion could see that this is, uh, to a certain point, legitimate resistance. In a way that uh, targeting Israeli soldiers at one point until the 90s, it used to split and erupt or create debate within Israel, while targeting civilians unites the Israelis. I think we are now that any targeting is, is thought to be an act of terror by the Israelis and almost by the international community, almost, I wouldn't say. Now, I think this is a moral crisis for Israel. In what sense a moral crisis? When you go to war, there are laws of war. And when you go to war, as Emmanuel taught us, Emmanuel Kant, you have to think about the day when the war is over. You have to think always about the day when the war is over. Because no war is absolute war. Every war, there is a limit to its absoluteness. I think it's a, it's a moral duty of Jewish Israelis to say to the Palestinians, this is what we think is a legitimate resistance, beyond which we think it's illegitimate. But to say to the Palestinians, Whatever you do is illegitimate resistance. Even the BDS is illegitimate re resistance. To ask Madonna not to appear in, in Tel Aviv, is this is a, 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 a cultural terrorism. To go to uh, the International Football uh, what's the Association to ask not uh, to allow Israel, this is a diplomatic terrorism. 
then what is left for Palestinians to resist? If you can't imagine your enemy as entitled to a kind of resistance, means that you're not treating him as a human being that has dignity and there is a limit to how much you can humiliate him. This is the process now in Israel, that they cannot imagine the Palestinian as something that have a right to resistance. As long as someone wouldn't say, what is the legitimate resistance, means that you are dehumanizing him. So what should be a response to this? I told you, at, I think that something of a massive mobilization of invention in new forms that are extremely visible and they are probably non-violent but can make a disturbance uh, uh, to life. I don't know. A cyber attack. I mean, something that makes something really visible um, uh, in this sense. Th 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 that's the only thing that I can think of at this stage. Um, I think the last uh, couple of minutes you spoke has been the best this evening, anyways. Um, I had a, a friend a long time ago who was a, a Boston cop, and he happened to be uh, Irish ethnically. And we were talking about the Troubles in Northern Ireland. I'm white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and I couldn't understand it. And I said, well, why can't they just together get together and discuss it? And he said, there's a long history of colonialism and you know, things like that. But he said, the big problem is the money. When the conflict keeps going because money keeps coming in, and he, he knew people, gangsters in Boston, who were sending boatloads of guns and money over to Ireland, Northern Ireland. Britain was doing the same thing. So everybody was getting their fair shake of money. So what would happen if all of a sudden the money dried up going to Israel and going to the Palestinians? Actually, I don't know much money going to the Palestinians now. Uh, I mean, there's lots of money going to Israel, I know. And actually... Uh, it doesn't make any difference whether it's a lot or a little. The money dries up. Oh, if the money dries up, actually, uh, violence would erupt. Not, it's uh, the opposite of Ireland, I think. I think that there's something that keeps the Palestinian economic life, even under occupation, not that miserable to make the people really become absolutely... So Israel is managing to keeping the Palestinian standard of living to a certain point a little bit tolerable. Actually, if that is gone, uh, then you would see more violence. But you're, you, you hit on something that I didn't touch upon absolutely, which is the global role Israel is playing. I mean, let's not be... Israel is taking on itself to play a global security role in that region. It sells um, uh, security industri uh, industry for the worst dictators in the world. It protects the worst regimes, and uh, uh, it gets uh, lots of power from that. The West is happy that Israel is doing that for them. So, so there is lots of money in the story as well. Probably not the way you described it, but, but that global role that Israel is, is playing recently is... Um, I kept it out of my conversation, but thank you for bringing money in. It's always good to speak about money. <laughs> It's better to have it. <laughs> it's a nice point to end our conversation, unless there is one final question. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a quick question. Um, in talking about like any any kind of mass mobilization of the Pal of the Palestinian people, um, I mean that that to me seems to be a means of resistance, but it's not necessarily a means to an end. And I think like. In terms of ruminating on the three possible solutions to the Palestinian question, whether that be expulsion, whether that be a one-state binational um, solution, or would that be a two-state solution? Um, in terms of like mobilizing the Palestinian people, how 
how exactly do you make that mobilization effective without really having like political an end problem. goal, like a political end project? Yeah, yeah. So this, is, kind of this is actually, uh, this is one million dollar question, uh, 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 definitely. Uh, actually, if uh, the, the main problem is, is now, uh, is not solution, is, is How can I say the the Oslo process and the creation of PA created a situation uh, where resistance is almost impossible for the Palestinians because the image of the soldier marching in the street that you throw stone on him and you throw stone on the occupation is not there anymore. So Israel took its troops from city centers. So the only place where you can clash to show that the that you're protesting is only on the roadblocks or on the um, those meeting points with the soldiers, um, but that's that's that small places of, of of friction. Now, I think, for example, for the issue of uh, the two state, the one state. There is a point where the Palestinian, I think, should give themselves, Israel, and the international community an expiring date for that solution. Saying, for example, the moment Israel decides to annex any part of the West Bank, we're done with the two-state solution. And I think they should say that beforehand, before anybody speaks or starts the annexation. Uh, the, the problem is, as you say, um, and this is one of the problems of the BDS, is that you have a movement that should be supporting a political program, but there is no PLO that actually have a clear program now. They, they have a program of two-state solution, but there's always playing one state, two states. But I think we are reaching the point where actually the political final end should be deduced from the means, not the opposite. What I mean by that, given the fact that you cannot lead a war of liberation, military resistance, and given the overpower of Israel and the incorporation of the West Bank, probably Given the fact that rights discourse, individual even rights discourse, it's probably better means as a means of struggle in this one geopolitical unit to end the apartheid. This is probably should be one consideration to think to move from two state to one state, simply because probably within this paradigm, you have more tools to conduct the struggle. But as I said, I think we are in a twilight zone because you still have international court decisions, international UN resolution speaks about the two-state uh, solution. You can't simply take all of these and just drop them as if they were not. So this is an ongoing, a long, a long process that probably, probably, um, this is the cunning of reason that this is the power of colonialism, as Marx taught us. It's unites. It's create a unity where there hasn't been a unity. And Israel is creating the unity of Palestine without knowing. And when you create the unity, that allows you to think of the situation as apartheid. Apartheid is not separation. It's separation within a unity. And that one of the problems that apartheid is not gripping the Palestinian, or at least the international community, and the Israeli Jews, is the fact that until now, the Palestinians themselves, they're asking for separation, because they said two-state solution. You can't at the same time think of the situation as apartheid, and you demand two-state solution, because you are interested in separation. You have to think of one political unit within which you are separated. In this sense, it's not that if you think of the reality as one 
one of apartheid, you think of the one-state solution. Probably if you think of the one-state solution, you can understand the reality as one of apartheid. In this sense, sometimes the solutions come before the problems. The imagination of a future solution would allow you to conceive of reality now as one of, of apartheid. That was not an answer, but the, the, those are just basic ideas to start a conversation about that. Taking that a step farther, and from what you said earlier, I wondered with the recent election and the far right um, majority gaining um, more ground, is the and the purity concepts that you were talking about, is there a risk of um, expulsion? You know. Uh, from the West Bank and Gaza so that the Jewish state is more pure um, going forward. Is that b being discussed? Is that, is that a possibility? I wish I knew, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, I mean, it's not discussed, but I think it's a fantasy. Sometimes fantasies become real, and the, the question is not if it's discussed or if there are such plans. I think that's not the issue. I think the issue that if there is a regional war and a situation of total chaos, and if there are some right-wing fanatics who decide to do that, and you need only for that probably thousand soldiers to do that, you don't need much. The question is whether the rest of the army would do anything to stop that. And here I don't know. I'm not sure that there would somebody would say, no, don't do it. Um, in that sense, the, the, the increasing level of allowing racism in Israel is really unprecedented. I mean, it's, um, it's allowed. I mean, the prime minister uh, incites against his citizens. So. On this happy note, <laughs> please join me in uh, thanking wife. For Thank you all.